Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this day of worship. We praise you for the word of God. We thank you for the spirit of the living God. We thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ. We praise your name because you've given us this opportunity to appear in your presence. We're asking that as you speak to us, we shall have the heart to receive your word. And your word will do good in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. In the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. And in the presence of God, all our spiritual, physical, material needs are met. In the Many of us have testimonies of what great things the Lord has been doing. There are many people in many places of worship who just read the Bible, sing the songs, but they do not know God in a personal way. They have read stories in the Bible. They have heard about the historical Jesus Christ. But as to what Jesus came to do on the face of the earth, they know nothing about. But we are the people that have got the privilege. Not only to hear. Not only to come. Not only to sing. Not only to pray. But to know what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. That even though it's almost 2,000 years ago, in our own experiences, it is as fresh as if it happened this morning. Many people have heard, my God, my God, why, has, why have you forsaken me? Spoken by Jesus on the cross. Some have memorized that. Some have repeated that very many times. But as for us, we had the experience. We know why he went to the cross cross of Calvary. We know why he prayed in the garden of Gethsemane. We know why he died. We know why he was buried. We know why on the third day he rose up from the dead. We know why the angel said we are seeking for the living among the dead. We know why he said he is not here, he is risen as he said. We know what it means when Jesus Christ Christ came to the disciples and said, Peace be unto you. It's so fresh in our experiences. And you are asking, How did you come about it? How did history become an experience in your own lives? This we will tell you. We had the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We accepted what the Bible has said. That is all that sinners shall die. The wages of sin is death. And because we recognize we were sinners, do you know it did not take us time? We went upon our knees asking the Lord for forgiveness. And the Spirit of God brought the, brought the word clear to our minds that if we confess and forsook our sins, we shall prosper. The Spirit of God made it very clear. Let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man, Esau, and let him seek the Lord, return unto the Lord. And the Lord will abundantly pardon. If we confess our sin, the Apostle John said, and he said, He is faithful and just. 
To forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I have the testimony, that's what I did. My brother standing by me here has a testimony, that's what he did. And you can ask members of the choir, that's what they did. And the people you have found opening the Bible, reading the Bible to you inside the scripture, that's what they did. Some of them did it kneeling down. Some did it standing up. Some of us did it with tears of repentance coming on our faces. Some of us did it praying aloud and saying, Oh God, have mercy upon my soul. Some of us did it in quiet assurance yet in certainty of faith. But this one thing we all did. We confess we had sinned against the Holy God in heaven. We asked for his mercy and pardon and forgiveness. What was the result? New life. Everlasting life. Eternal life. The joy of salvation. Coming forth in our hearts. And the spirit of God bearing witness with our spirit that we have become the children of God. More than that, he also healed our bodies. He delivered us from the oppression and suppression or depression of the enemy. So we can say our souls are saved. Our mind renewed. Our body healed. And yet, when you have this victory, you want to know to keep the victory. Because enemies do not want you to keep this victory. Satan will resist you. He'll tempt you. He'll come against you. Wanting to take away the victory that you have got. And I know that the greatest thing you'll want to know is how can I keep the victory I have got. And I'm so happy to tell you that that salvation you have got, you can keep it. The healing you have got, you can keep it. The deliverance you have got, you can keep it. The victory in your soul, in your spirit, in your body, in your circumstances that you have got, you can keep it. Since you got converted, haven't you met people who ridiculed you? Who didn't make anything of this salvation experience? Haven't you been persecuted? And yet all that the devil is aiming at in people persecuting or ridiculing or jesting at you is that you lose the salvation or the victory or whatever joy you have. If Jesus said the winds will blow, the storm will come, the rain will come and the flood will fill the land. What was he saying? He was saying circumstances will come against you. Things that are not pleasing or pleasant will come against you. And at such a time you want to know how your anchor can remain fasting to the rock. After you are healed, like after a first day revival hour, your symptoms may come back. Your eyesight had been clear when you came to the Thursday revival miracle hour. And you have been rejoicing in the healing of the Lord. But then the symptoms of the sickness. The symptoms of the pain may come back. Now, how do you get the victory or maintain the victory when the symptoms come back? Do you remember that after Jesus Christ came out of the water of baptism in River Jordan? After the Holy Ghost came upon him as the as emblem of a dove. After the voice spoke from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. 
Where was he led after that? Into the wilderness. And do you know after the Sunday worship? If you are not sufficiently grounded in the Bible, after the voice had spoken from heaven, after the assuring voice of the Lord speaking to you, you are my child. After the Spirit of God has borne witness within you are to a child of God. After you have been sanctified. Or after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Do you know the next place may be the wilderness? And I can tell you in the wilderness. The devil will be around. He'll whisper into your ears. He'll want to get your attention. He'll want to take away from you what you have got. He'll be giving you suggestions. There'll be temptation. Try it. And discouragement can come. You can come into despair. But in such a wilderness, you'll want to know how can I keep my victory? And I am so happy to tell you when you get into the wilderness experience, when things are dry, no disciple around, no friend around, no sympathizer around, when the angels are not near, when the voice from heaven is silent, when John the baptizer has been withdrawn from you, when the counsel of the helper is not near, when the voice of the tempter is very, is very great, when the hunger is biting, when the sun is very bright, when the heat is a little bit too much, when your need is very great, when you feel lonely, how can you keep the victory? That's exactly why we're here this afternoon. Fear may come. Doubt may come. You may suddenly realize that you are very weak at such a point. But whenever there is doubt, or fear, or depression, or weakness, or temptation, or the symptoms return, can we keep the victory? Yes, we can. But how? Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Enoch lived 300 years in victory in the presence of God. How did he do it? Noah among the unbelieving crowd in his generation went on building the ark, building the ark, building the ark, and there was no drop of rain. In all the years he was building, how did he stand all the jeering or jesting of the people? Abraham expecting the promise of God, the fulfillment of the promise of God, one year, two years, three years, five years, ten years, twenty years, and yet still expecting and looking forward to the fulfillment of the promise. How could he wait so long? Abraham, Moses believing that God will make him a deliverer of his people and he waited for 20 years, for 30 years, for 40 years until by the backside of the desert he heard the voice of God saying, Moses, Moses. 
and he said, Here am I. And now he said, I will send you unto Pharaoh. How could he wait and keep the vision 40 years? I'll tell you how. Most of you know, 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 Joshua and Caleb and a number of other Israelites left Egypt and they kept on walking and walking. And if you ask them, where are you going? We're going to the land of Canaan. You met them the second year. Where are you going? We're going to the land of Canaan and kept on walking and walking. Five years passed by. Seven years passed by. Eleven years passed by. Thirty-three years passed by. Meet Joshua. Joshua, where are you going? We're going to the land of Canaan. And you've been going and going and going. Thirty-three years, thirty-five, thirty-seven, thirty-nine, until the fortieth year. How could they keep focusing their attention upon the Lord until the feet of Joshua got into Canaan? I'll tell you how. Nimba, I'm a Israeli. I take level. I Joshua. I want to go to the Egypt. I want to see Lord. See, I like Canaan. Oduma, Oduma, no koja. Oduma, wa koja. Titi, Oduma, tali ni ogba koja. To, to basi be lo. Ni bo ni enlo, enlo si le Canaan. Ni bo le enlo, enlo si le Canaan. Once I ni lo be. Titi, Oduma ka di ni ogoji. Want to test? Wa do Titi o fi di ogoji odo. Ti es e Joshua to pi kani le Canaan. Have you been expecting? Have you been expecting a particular promise? Yeah, oti reti le ri kabi. And you have been holding on to the word of God. One year has passed. Two years gone. Three years gone. And people are asking you, are you still praying? Are you still reading the Bible? Are you still expecting that God will do it? At that time, fear could come in. Doubt could come in. Depression could come in. Anything can happen at that time. Except you know what Enoch knew, what Moses knew, what Abraham knew, what Elijah knew, what the patriarchs of old and the prophets of, of old, what they knew. This is it. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. At that time, the book of God was small. Only five of the four of the books of the Bible had been written. Of half six, Job and Moses and um, the books of Moses. And so the Lord was telling Joshua, You want to keep the victory. You want to get to the Canaan, to the land of Canaan. You want to enjoy the promises of God. You want to overcome your enemies. You want to keep in good relationship with between you and God. Before you ever go too far, this book of the Lord must not depart out of your mouth. Meditate upon the words therein day and night. Meditate upon the word of God day and night. When somebody offends you, the natural thing is to meditate upon the offense. The natural sin, the natural sin is to meditate upon the offense. But do you know that's how you lose your victory? When you lose your job, the natural thing to do is to meditate on what you have lost. When sickness strikes your body, the natural thing to do is to meditate and concentrate upon the sickness and the pain. When you are poor and there is no money, or when your money has been stolen away, when something has been taken away from you. The natural sin everybody will do is to meditate upon the loss. When you are persecuted, when friends forsake you, when you are tempted, when your flesh is waging war against you, the natural sin people do is to meditate upon the circumstances around them. But if you want to keep the victory, turn your 
eyes away from the problem. Turn your eyes away from the loss. Turn your eyes away from the symptoms of the sickness. Meditate upon the word of God. The promises of God. The warnings of God. The commandments of God. Meditate day and night. In the day when people are around you. In the day when people are calling your attention to your problem. Meditate upon the word of God. In the night when everything is quiet and you are all alone. In the night when there is nobody around you. And the natural thing to do is to call back your problems into your mind. Meditate on the word of God. You said, but I can't do it. Then you are saying God is a liar. Because he has given you a commandment which he knows you cannot keep. Oh no, I believe let all men be last, but God is true. If God says you can do it, I believe you can do it. If God tells us to meditate upon the word of God, I believe we can meditate upon the word of God. In Psalm 1, reading from verse 1, Psalm 1, verse 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but is delight, is in the law of the Lord. In his law does he meditate day and night. That, that is telling us the same thing we have read in Joshua. That the believer wants to keep his victory. At the time when the women come to tempt you. At the time when the men come to entice you. At the time when there is a temptation to give bribes. At the time when they are telling you not to stand by the word of God. You call back to your mind the word of God. And you know you are not of this world. Heaven is our home. Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. And if Jesus has so much loved me, if God has so much loved me, why shouldn't I love him too? And respond in obeying his commandments because I love him. And then instead of Yielding to the temptation, I meditate upon the word of God. In the day and in the night, I keep on meditating, meditating on the word of God. There lies the victory of the believer. In Psalm 119, Psalm 119. Verses 11, 13, 14, and 15. The word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word have I hid in my heart. When I was in the primary school, our teachers, um, you know, they struggled very much to make us memorize this Bible. We kept the word in our heads. But do you know when you keep it in the head? It doesn't take sin away because sin is not in your head, it's in your heart. We can write it down in the exam. We can and cram it and speak it out. You know, if, if you repeat John chapter 3 verse 16 in the ears of the parrot for one year, I tell you after one year, the parrot, when you say, good morning, parrot, the parrot will say, for God so love the world. I was like that in the past. And if you ask me one part of the Bible, I could pump it out of the well. 
But then when you become saved, you become a child of God. That word of God is hidden in your heart. And you'll be able to say, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. In verse 13, with my lips I, I declared all the judgments of my mouth, and, of thy mouth. And, and I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. Verse 15. I will meditate. I will meditate. What's that verse telling us, my brother, my sister? It is saying that it doesn't come naturally. If you are expecting that this thing will just come upon you like a ripe fruit from the tree, you'll be mistaken. But you will to do it. You make up your mind, I am going to meditate upon the word of God. When temptation comes, you have to will to determine. You have to determine to meditate upon the word of God. When there is sickness in the family, and people are telling you that this is what kills one, so this is what kills one, so you have to determine to keep the, to meditate on the word of God. I will meditate in thy precepts. And I will have respect unto thy ways. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, the Apostle Paul, by the Spirit of the Living God, has told us how we ought to think as believers. That is how we ought to meditate as believers. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Let me read it from verse 6. Be careful for nothing. Be careful for nothing. What does that say? You know, this is King James English. English. And if you don't read it right, you'll be thinking it means don't be careful when you are driving. And it's not saying that at all. But if you read um, other versions of the Bible, the New English Bible, it's saying fret at nothing. Don't be fretful at anything. That means don't worry, don't be anxious. And uh, why pray if you can, if you can worry? And why worry if you have prayed already? If you are depending upon the Lord, even when the problems come, be careful for nothing. Be fretful at nothing. Be worried by nothing. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, let's say that together. In everything. In everything. In everything. In everything. In everything. In everything. That is the word of God. In everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, what Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things, meditate on these things. These are the things a believer must meditate about. Ask yourself, is it true? Is it honest? Is it just? Is it pure? Is it lovely? Is this a good report? Is it virtuous? 
Is it going to bring praise and glory to the Lord? Only then will I meditate on it. So then, if we want to succeed in our Christian living, if we want to keep the victory that God has given us already, meditate on the word of God. But that's not all. Practice the word of God. You meditate on the word of God so as to do or practice that word of God. If the Bible says, forgive all people who have offended you. When you are offended, the tendency is to meditate on the offense. But no, you meditate on the forgiveness of God. You meditate on the promise of God. You meditate on the love of God and the commandment to love one another. But then you don't only meditate on forgiving your brother, you carry it out, you practice it, you do it. In Joshua again, chapter 1, verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. That's taking for granted that cursing has gone already. That is taking for granted that cursing, abusing, Cursing other people has gone already. That is taking it for granted. It means that you are not misusing your tongue anymore. It's only the word of God that comes out of your mouth. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night. That thou mayest observe to do. That thou Thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. Meditating upon the word of God and then practicing that word of God. James chapter 1 from verse 22. James chapter 1 from verse 22. But be ye doers of the word, but not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Practice the word. Carry out the word. Do exactly what the word of God has told you to do. You may not feel like it. But do it anyhow. As I've said, if, if you're offended, you may not feel like forgiving. Forgive the person anyhow. When a problem has come, you may not feel like praying, but pray. When you wake up in the morning, you may not feel like reading the Bible but do it and when you have to give your love or something to a neighbor to a brother to a sister you may not feel like doing it don't let the selfishness grab you do what the word of God has told you to do be ye doers of the word and not hearers only now, those who are here as only, what does the Bible say about them? The Bible says they are deluding themselves, deceiving themselves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, if anybody be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass, in a mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgeteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he be not a forgetful hearer but a 
doer of the work. This man shall be blessed. This man shall be blessed. This man shall be blessed in his deeds. And so we must meditate on the word of God. And we must practice the word of God. That's what it means to abide in Christ or to abide in the word of God. In John chapter 15 verse 7 If ye abide in me and my words abide in you Ye shall ask what ye will and shall be done unto you and that means we must give the word of God the first place in our lives. You know people who put the word of God last in their lives. If something happens at home, they will cry, they will groan, they will curse, they will do every other thing. Then later, at last, they remember, oh, I think I should pray. If a child has a problem at home, there are some people they will go to the idol first. I mean, among the unbelievers. They'll go to the idol first. Or they'll go to other sources of help first. And when the idols fail, because they will always fail. That wood at the corner of the house when it fails, because it will always fail. It's better to throw it into the fire. It's a failure anyhow. And then they'll come back to God. But God is saying, put me first. Think about me first. Talk to me first. Discuss the matter with me first. Give the word of God first place in your life. Meditate on the word of God. Practice the word of God. And then give the word the first place in your life. In Proverbs chapter 4 verse 20. My son. Son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. What does it mean, attend to my words? You think about this. You are rushing out in the morning. And you want to go for an interview. And you must be there at 8 o'clock in the morning. Just at that time. Somebody came in a friend. And he said, oh friend, it's a long time we have seen. Uh, I, can we sit down for some time and talk together? Oh, you say, my friend. I've got an important matter to attend to. We'll see another time. I must get to this interview right away. I must attend to this scene immediately. That means I'm giving this interview the first place and you have to take a place after the interview. My son, attend to my words. That means give that word of God the first place in your life. Incline thine ear to my saints. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. Why? Because they are life unto those that find them. And health to all their flesh. Health or medicine to all their flesh. And then listen to the Spirit of God talking to you. Walk in the Spirit. Live in the Spirit. Do not fulfill the suggestions of your flesh. Because in Romans chapter 8 verse 14 The word of God says As many as are led As many as are led By the spirit of God They are the sons of God But before you can walk in the spirit because Before you can live by the voice of the spirit You must have done what we are told in Galatians chapter 5 
verse 24 they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and loves if we live in the spirit let us also walk in the spirit to walk in the spirit simply means to walk after the footsteps of Jesus Christ to ask yourself every time before you do something if Jesus Christ were faced with taking this decision I want to take what will Jesus do? If Jesus Christ was confronted with this sin what decision will he take? My brother, my sister, this is how to keep the victory. Meditate on the word of God. Practice the word of God. Give the word of God the first place in your life. And walk in the spirit. Follow the footsteps of Jesus Christ. Live like Jesus Christ. But you know, if you have not been born again, that's difficult. In fact, it's impossible. It's like telling a lizard to swim. It's like telling a dog to fly. It's like telling an eagle to live in the river, in the sea, underneath the sea. It is like telling you to breathe with your ear and to hear with your mouth. You cannot meditate on the word of God if you are not born again. You cannot practice love if you are not born again. You cannot put the word of God first and give it the first place if you are not born again. Your temper will take the first place. Your pride will take the first place. Your covetousness will take the first place. Place. Your ambition will take the first place. But I know you want to be born again if you are not. I know you want the victory in your life if you don't have it already. And it's so simple. If you just realize you are a sinner and tell the Lord I am a sinner and I want you to forgive me and I want you to take all my sins away. Jesus died for me. And you know he actually died for you. And whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yes, my friend, you can be saved this afternoon. And if you are already saved, I am pleading with you, keep the victory. Keep the word of God. Meditate on the word. Practice the word. Give it the first place. Walk in the spirit. Follow the footsteps of Jesus. Let us pray. Are you dominated by anger? Are you dominated by evil habits? Are you dominated by lying? Has adultery and fornication spoiled your life? Have you lost control over your tongue? Is temptation always putting your back to the wall? You can be saved this afternoon. Because whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Are you born again already? And you want to keep the victory? Are you saved already? And you want to keep the victory? Are you healed already? And you want to keep the healing? Are you sanctified and you are desirous to keep the experience? Meditate on the word of God. Meditate on the word of God. Practice the word of God. Give the word of God the first place in your life. 
walk in the spirit. Jesus walked in the spirit. Walk in the spirit. Follow the footsteps of Jesus Christ. 